In this video, we will discuss how to interpret clinical data. This will be a, an introductory video for those who are not too familiar with reading and interpreting clinical data, and we'll walk through an example of uh, actual clinical data release and how that impacted the price of a stock. Understanding clinical data is one of the most important skills in biotech, but it can be tricky. If you just focus on the headline takeaway in a press release without analyzing the study in detail yourself, you could lose a lot of money or miss out on the chance to make a lot of money. So let's jump into an example. So we're going to take a look at a stock called uh, Next Cure. So this is a cancer company developing an immunotherapy. And back in November 2019, their stock tripled from a little bit under $30 a share to 90 overnight. So why did this happen? So if we go to the SEC Edgar database, we can look around and we don't really see any filings for November 4th or 5th which is when the stock jumped. So we don't really see, get any information there. If you go to their website, we see a press release here um, for uh, on November 4th. And this press release basically just says they're hosting a webcast at uh, some uh, cancer conference. So it seems like it doesn't say too much. Um, if you read it a little bit further, it says they're gonna be discussing some clinical data from an ongoing phase one study. And it sounds like that clinical data presentation might cause the stock to move. Um, but this presentation isn't until the 9th. And if you recall, the stock price was on November 5th. So the, the presentation hadn't actually happened um, by the time that the stock jumped. So what's, what's going on here? So if you're familiar with medical conferences, or if you've been to some before, you may have a guess. Uh, but if not, we'll quickly discuss what medical conferences are and why they're important for investors. Uh, so basically, uh, medical conferences are generally organized by some sort of physician society. The ASCO is a big cancer conference. Uh, SITC is another can cancer conference, ASGT. There's a bunch of other um, medical s conferences organized by societies. And in these conferences, basically researchers, including companies, present uh, new clinical data on various treatments. So it's a way for researchers to basically educate the clinical population on new treatments and how they might be useful uh, in clinical practice. So this is important for investors because clinical data, as you recall, is the currency of value in early stage biotech. So any new clinical data release has the potential to move a stock price because clinical data determines whether a drug will get approved by the FDA, prescribed by physicians, uh, and ultimately reimbursed by insurance companies as well. So these conferences are important to investors. Um, generally, they will uh, companies or researchers will present kind of a brief presentation of ongoing research. This is usually before they publish the data in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, and at the beginning of the conference, the conference organizer often releases abstracts. So an abstract is basically a summary of a study. So when these conferences start, the organizer releases abstracts for all the people who are going to present over the you know three or four days of the conference. And then uh, as the conference you know, proceeds over the three or four days that the conference lasts, the researchers will present the data in more detail. So you could probably guess from, from what I just talked about here that what happened is that uh, NextCure released an abstract um, about this phase one study on November 5th. So here's the abstract, it's super short. And again, these abstracts are just summaries of studies and an abstract for a conference presentation is going to be even you know shorter and more preliminary than the abstract for you know a published peer-reviewed study. Uh, but basically, this abstract was pretty brief. The, we'll just jump into the most important part here, and then we'll talk about some definitions and terminology, and then move on to talking about this and in a little bit more detail once we understand the basic background information. Um, so basically, this was a phase one study of this drug called NC318 which is targeting an antibody called Siglec 15. So they did a phase one study. Um, they studied a bunch of different cancer types, uh, including lung cancer, ovarian cancer, melanoma. And the highlight was they saw single agent activity in lung cancer, including one complete response and a partial response, and then two patients with a stable disease out of a total of seven lung cancer patients. So um, we'll, we'll talk about the, the definitions here. Um, so we can better understand why investors are are uh, care about this these findings. So if you're not familiar with these terms, basically a CR in the context of a cancer drug is a complete response. A PR is a partial response and ORR is the objective response rate. 
So basically, this is a measure of whether a cancer drug is working. So typically, you take a CT or some other scan of a patient at the beginning of the study, you measure the tumor lesions, and then at pre-specified time points throughout the rest of the study, you do another scan and you measure those lesions, and you see what happened after the patient has been on the drug for you know a couple weeks or a couple months. So a complete response is what is defined as if all the tumor lesions are gone. So you take a CT scan at the beginning of the study, you take another CT scan. If there's no more tumor lesions on that scan, that's a complete response. If the tumor shrinks but doesn't completely disappear, then that's a partial response. And then to get the ORR or objective response rate, you take the number of complete responses, add it to the number of partial responses, and then divide that by the total eligible patients. So that's just sort of simple definitions, basic concepts in uh, cancer clinical studies. Why does this matter? So ORR indicates whether a cancer drug is working. Not only that, but it can be used to support FDA approval. Um, and it's often used to guide treatment decisions. So there's a bunch of different things you can measure in a study to get a sense for whether a drug's actually working, but some of them aren't as impactful as others. So there's this concept called approvable endpoints, uh, which are endpoints that the FDA can rely on to say, yes, we're going to approve this drug or no, we're not going to approve this drug. Um, so there's a lot of things you can measure in a study. Um, you can measure anything from how long does a patient live if they get a drug versus how long do patients live when they get controls to things like, um, you know, how much of a certain metabolic marker is in a patient's blood after they get a drug. So approvable endpoints are usually endpoints that directly measure or correlate strongly with clinical benefit. So do patients actually get healthier um, due to the drug in a way that's significant to their um, to improving their disease? So other endpoints like how much of a drug is in a patient's blood at a given time are important for understanding how uh, to use the drug in clinical practice and how to design clinical studies. But things like that are not approvable endpoints because they don't really correlate with clinical benefit. So OR is a nice endpoint. Uh, and this is just a chart here from uh, the FDA's guidance on clinical trial endpoints for approval of cancer drugs. And just quick, quick side note here, um, the FDA publishes guidance on a whole lot of things that are relevant to getting drugs approved. And uh, it's a really great resource for learning more about disease areas and trying to ascertain the probability that a drug could get approved. Um, here's a link to this particular guidance document here, but basically they talk about if you're studying a cancer drug, you know, FDA wants to help get more cancer drugs approved. So how can drug companies design their studies in a way that helps FDA determine whether they should approve a drug? So OR here is one of the endpoints that they highlight that can be used as an approval endpoint. So if you do a study and you measure as your primary endpoint ORR, FDA can consider that as something that can support the approval of a drug. So ORR is nice because it measures drug effect, um, not natural history. So that's an important concept in drug development is that a lot of diseases, patients can improve over time even without a drug or certain aspects of a disease can improve over time even if a patient isn't on the drug. So that can sort of mess with your determination of whether a drug is working or whether a patient's natural disease is just running its course. But it's not likely that a patient's tumor is going to shrink uh, in these cancers without treatment. Another benefit of OR is you can measure it more quickly than something like overall survival. So a lot of times overall survival is really what you care about, like how much longer is someone going to live if they have cancer, if they get your drug. But it can take a really long time to measure that because you know patients may live years, so it may take years to measure overall survival. Um, but something like ORR, you can measure that within months. And it's also an objective and quantitative endpoint. You basically take a, the scan and then you measure lesions. Um, so it's quantitative and it's fairly objective. It's not as subject to bias as other uh, endpoints are. Okay, so now that we have a little bit more context on what happened in this press release, let's let's go back to the abstract and or what happened in this abstract. Let's go back to the abstract and see if we can get a little bit more meaning out of this uh, this results paragraph here. So. Again, this is the key part of this abstract. Single agent activity has been seen in lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, including one complete response, a partial response, uh, one stable disease with some tumor reduction, and then two other stable diseases. So that is uh, means that the, the lung cancer best overall, best objective response rate was two out of seven or 29%, and disease control rate, which is basically 
Um, in addition to adding this complete response and partial response, you add stable disease with 71%. Okay, so now you probably have a little bit better sense for why that matters, but it's still not, you know, it may not be entirely clear. Um, you know, for example, why is lung cancer so important? What about all these other patients here? Um, and why is like two out of seven? Is this, I mean, it's a really small number. It's only 29%, which isn't super high. Like, why is that actually meaningful? Um, and there's other things here that, you know, you may know the definitions, but you may not necessarily know the impact of it. So we'll talk a little bit more about the impact of, of these results. So it helps to know this context. You may be familiar with PD-1 inhibitors or checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, so these are a new class of drugs that were developed you know, about 10 or so years ago, and they're one of the best-selling drug classes of all times. Uh, these drugs generate over $30 billion in annual sales. So these are the two main ones, Keytruda and Optivo, but there's a bunch of others as well. And uh, they have become some of the most impactful medicines from a business standpoint, um, but they have also really revolutionized cancer care. And for a subset of patients, these PD-1 inhibitors uh, turn their cancer from a death sentence into a manageable chronic illness. So uh, for uh, lung cancer is actually the biggest subset of the PD-1 market. So these drugs are approved to treat a bunch of different diseases. Um, first in melanoma and then in lung cancer and other diseases as well. But 60% of the sales are in lung cancer. So that's why they highlighted, or you know, that's one reason why you think they might have highlighted lung cancer here and why investors got excited because it looked like there was some activity in this biggest subset of the market. Now, they didn't say anything about these other indications, which could be a little bit concerning, but we'll get back to that later. Um, but basically, they had some activity in this really big market. Now, how much activity do they have and is it is it important? So we can get a sense of that. You can talk to physicians, but you can also just read the literature here. So these are a couple um, charts from some of the, the more broadly cited studies of PD-1 inhibitors, of which pembrolizumab is probably the most, um, the most effective according to a lot of these studies. So this study here is as frontline therapy. So if patients had not received any systemic therapy before, uh, lung cancer patients had not received any systemic therapy before, they did a study of comparing this PD-1 inhibitor to chemotherapy. And what they saw was f there was a 45% objective response rate for patients receiving the PD-1 inhibitor compared to 28% for chemo. So that gives you a sense of, and this was an incredibly impactful study and um, is very largely responsible for that 30 billion in annual sales for this drug class. So that gives you a sense of what a uh, 45% ORR in this patient population means in terms of a drug's market potential. And this other study is helpful for context as well. So this was a prior study to this one. Um, this one was done in patients who had a variety of systemic therapies. So they had about 19% of patients who had no prior systemic therapies. This study, all patients had no prior systemic therapies. Uh, but this one, 81% of the patients had at least some prior therapy. So this was a little bit more, uh, a little bit kind of later stage, sicker patient population. And in this patient population, they saw a 19% ORR. So the combination of you know these two facts that the potential market for a checkpoint inhibitor that works in uh, non-small cell lung cancer patients who don't respond to PD-1 inhibitors is huge. It's over a $10 billion market. So even here in the best case scenario, 45% of patients don't actually respond to these PD-1 inhibitors. And some of those patients who do respond actually develop resistance. So this suggests that even though these PD-1s are great, there's still a huge market um, for patients who don't respond to these drugs. And then secondarily, that two out of seven, you know, kind of 28% number, that actually can be clinically meaningful. Like getting one complete response, if it's a real complete response in lung cancer, is is something to be, you know, interested in because these tumors just don't go away on their own. There must be something, some drug must be doing something positive here. However, the market's enthusiasm for these data was pretty short-lived. The stock basically went back to its prior levels and then bounced up a little bit um, after the study was released. So, so what happened here? So if we go back to the abstract, we'll note that it includes data as of August 2019, and this presentation was going to take place in November. So there were 11 patients who hadn't reached the first assessment at the time of the abstract in August. So there's more data that's gonna be reported um, in more detail during this conference. And if you're only looking at, you know, seven total patients in uh, lung cancer here, that's a pretty small number. And 
usually it you know you're not going to be able to rely too much on extrapolating this result to a, a larger study so when they presented more detail on the study in this conference there was the news wasn't quite as positive so this shows you not just the lung cancer patients here in LCLC, but all of the patients that they had data on at the time of this presentation. So here, basically, the, the way to read this chart is the dose levels are the colors of the bars. So these, you know, this sort of greenish blue is a patient's got an eight milligram dose all the way up to 1600 milligrams um, with these brown bars. And then this is the type of cancer they have here on the left, melanoma breast cancer, lung cancer. And then these show what the patient's sort cl current clinical status is. So the red is when a complete response starts. Uh, and again, that's when you take a, a scan of a patient like a CT scan. And if you don't see any tumor, that's a complete response. Partial response here in yellow, um, stable disease are these green diamonds. And then progressive disease is this, uh, these gray boxes here. So they reported in the abstract, these two responses. And you'll note that no other patients had a response, a complete or a partial response out of this whole data set. Um, and only these two patients were in NSCLC, but no other patients with any other type of cancer had a response. So that's a little bit disconcerting because it kind of seems like they highlighted the NSCLC, not necessarily because it was the biggest market, but because they kind of potentially cherry picked some of this data um, because this was the one particular disease that the drug worked in. If you zoom in though onto these patients, there's another sort of concerning finding, and that is that the patient who did have the complete response was on the lowest dose of the drug. So a lot of times um, you want to see a dose response. You wanna see patients who get the higher doses have better clinical effect, because that gives you more confidence that the drug is actually driving the clinical improvement. If you don't see a dose response, then it can be a little bit fishy and you need to look at the design of the study to see if there could be anything else that could be causing that uh, that response and confounding the these results um so in this particular study like orr you know natural history is one thing that you would typically look at if you see a some response but doesn't have a, a dose response but because of orr is the endpoint here it's probably not going to be a natural history thing but it could be due to background therapies so these patients were pretty heavily treated coming into the study. Uh, these patients had a medium of, median of four prior therapies, and 100% of them had received some sort of immunotherapy before. Now, that was by design. They're trying to develop a drug for patients who don't respond to PD-1 inhibitors, but if there's a bunch of different background therapy, it's harder to attribute a response to the treatment drug versus something else that's going on in the background. Now, I didn't see anything in this abstract that defined, you know, whether these patients were still on these background therapies or what the washout period was or, or anything like that. So I, I'm not saying that this response was due to um, one of these other treatments they were on, but we can't really rule that out without knowing more information. Um, and when companies, you know, do things like only talk about NSLC patients, because that's with the only response they saw, you can't necessarily give them the benefit of the doubt when uh, interpreting some of these results. So, um, th these two facts, the fact that there were no other responses besides these two in this broader population, combined with the fact that the patients who responded, had a complete response, had was on the lowest dose, and then these patients um, with the higher dose, there was one partial response, but the rest of them just had progressive disease. And then when you add in these other patients, so you get to, you know, I think, um, I guess 13 total patients compared to, or the, uh, a valuable population of 10 compared to seven, the, the overall re or objective response rate drops from two to seven to uh, two out of 10, which is you know not not quite so interesting. So overall, um, and then, yeah, then one other thing, so there was one, the confirmed complete response, the patient had three prior chemo regimens and they were on a PD-1 inhibitor as well. And they had stable disease with that drug and then progression. Um, we don't really know anything else about that patient, like were they still on any of these drugs or what did their immune system look like? So it's, it's you know, we don't know exactly what happened here. You can't necessarily say, say that they didn't respond to the drug, but it, it's, you know, this is one data point and it's not a perfectly clear data point. And there were no other positive data points like this in the study. Um, so overall, uh, when you take a look at this study, 
um, in totality in more detail versus just the abstract, it doesn't look nearly as pretty. So the end of the story here, essentially um, in July of 2020, so this was you know eight, eight months or so after they had done this abstract and uh, presentation at the SITSI conference in 2019, they stopped the 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 lung cancer uh program for this product in c13 um so if you recall the study that they were presenting here was a phase one two study so they had reported on some of the phase one information but they didn't start the phase two part yet so here they're basically saying that they're not going to advance the um nc318 into lung cancer or ovarian cancer in phase two and at the same time, their chief medical officer departed, which is you know, never, never a good sign. So um, it turns out that the initial hype around the complete response and uh, lung cancer here ended up just being a false signal. And this drug is no longer being developed in that indication. So what are the takeaways here? And again, this is a very simple introduction to clinical data. We basically just looked at an abstract and then a couple of slides of a conference presentation. Um, and when you're actually analyzing a full clinical study or looking at a publication, you know, New England Journal of Medicine or something, there's going to be a lot more complex considerations. But this is just a, an introduction to some of the pitfalls and uh, challenges associated with interpreting clinical data. So obviously, um, be careful when you're interpreting data from small studies. Um, it's in this market, there's a lot of excitement around, you know, one or two patients with a great response. And in some cases, it can actually be incredibly meaningful. Um, a sign that the drug is working. But you really have to be careful about um, what the patient population is, what the natural history is, or other treatments, what endpoints are measuring. You just have to pay a lot of attention to other factors when you're interpreting data from small studies. Um, uncontrolled studies as well. So the study next year did was an open label study, meaning that um, you know the, the people knew what drug the patients were getting and there wasn't uh, was also no control in the study. So if you do have a control, then that can help to uh, control for some of these other factors that might confound the results, but there's no control in this study. So you have to be extra careful when you interpret it. Um, same thing for randomization. This was obviously not a randomized study as well because all the patients got one drug, but that makes it harder for you to draw firm conclusions from studies because there's just so many other variables that, that come into account. Um, so even if you don't have a, if you have a study that's uncontrolled, not randomized and small, in this market, you know, people do draw conclusions from these and sometimes rightly so, but you really need to pay attention to things like the natural history, the other therapies the patients were on, the specifics of the patient population, understanding, um, you know, how these patients progress through disease, what other treatment options are available to them, how disease progression is measured, how clinical outcomes are measured, what's important to patients uh, in terms of their, um, you know, livelihood and, and healthiness. Um, and just be very careful and do a lot of research when you interpret this data. And then Another thing that's an important takeaway here is that one other sort of tool you can use to help increase or decrease your confidence in whether a particular clinical outcome is attributable to a drug is just seeing a dose response. So if one patient, you know, if a group of patients get like a an eight milligram dose um, and then another group of patients get a hundred milligram dose, you would expect to see the patient with a hundred milligram dose have a better response on whatever clinical endpoint. And they may also have, you know, worse safety outcomes if the drug has some 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 adverse effects. But seeing that uh, dose response helps you better have more confidence that the drug is actually doing something uh, for these patients. And then the overall takeaway here is that the market is not always right. And companies are often, you know, to use sort of a, a, nice, a nice word, optimistic in how they interpret and report their data. Um, another thing I didn't mention is that the lockup period for next year was i think on november 11th the date they released the abstract so the company had gone public earlier in 2019 and usually when a company goes public insiders um insider shareholders so people who own the stock when it was private um after the stock goes public they can't sell for like 180 days um and that 180 day period expired on november 5th so whether that has anything to do with the state release or not you know i don't know but um, companies do have a certain set of motivations that are sometimes aligned with investors and with patients, but sometimes, you know, you, you, you have to be careful that the incentives of a company may um, sometimes influence how they report things.
So hopefully this is was helpful. Um, again, this is a very basic intro to interpreting clinical data. Uh, this is really geared towards people who don't have a lot of experience analyzing clinical data before. And we'll get into some more uh, interesting uh, topics on this subject later. But I think it's important to have some sort of basic foundation for uh, understanding and analyzing clinical data. And hopefully this short abstract demonstrated some of the pitfalls to you of uh, that are inherent in analyzing clinical data. So thanks for taking uh, time to watch the video, and we will see you next time.